Go ahead. Get if somebody else wants to do an ear.
It did. It one time I was open, I got it loose. Oh, my hair. I was facing in your stitch and it just keeps sticking on down. belongs to you as much as anyone else. You'd probably get better shots if you came to this door. Here working with commercial glass beads, the stainless steel needle and flax thread. For this material, 82 types of bead work. First type is scroll work. It is displayed on the bench in front of you, which is used to decorate the clothing of men and women. The second type of bead work is a solid work. This is what they're working with today to make their belts. As you'll notice, they'll pick up one bead at a time. 
So it to the next. This allows the thread to pass through each bead twice. So if the belt should break, it will be a clean break. None of the beads would be lost. The belt could be easily mended. Once the beaded part has been completed, we'll take two strips of leather, sew it to each end. This will serve as ties. It will take them three to four days to complete a belt, according to the length and width of the belt. Before this modern material was introduced, we were using bones, teeth, and claws of wild animals as decorations. We also used the gray Indian corn beads and small seashells traded to us from the coastal tribes. Needles were carved from the straight bone of the deer's leg located right above the hoof. Thread was made from dried inner fibers of the Indian hemp plant. Do you have any questions? If not, your next stop is... These ladies here are working with native clay and they've found under the top soil the rivers in this area, making their pots. They use two methods, a ball and a cool method. When they're working with a cool method, they'll shape their clay into a flat disc. By placing cools on top of each other, they'll build their pots to a desired height. Working with a ball method, they'll shape their clay into a shape. Once the pots have been formed, they're set out to dry until they become firm enough to work with. Then by using a metal tool or a seashell, they'll carve down their pots to an even thickness. Scrape marks and wipe off the use a wet cloth. Using a bone or a smooth stone will give their pots a shiny finish. To put designs on their pots, they'll use a wooden paddle or a bone which already had the designs carved into them. By using sticks, seashells, or other items, they'll carve their own designs in their pots. After this is done, the pots are set into the sun to dry until they turn a chalky white. Then they're ready to be burnt. A pit is dug and the fire is started. Pots are placed around the fire with the openings toward the flame until they turn a bluish color. Then they're rolled directly into the fire until the fire dies out. The color of our pots are determined by the type of wood we use to burn them. Dark colors come from soft woods because they give off more smoke. Lighter colors come from hardwoods because they give off more heat. Now our people were never known to use a potter's wheel or a mold to make our pots, nor do we paint or glaze our pots. Our pots you want to use as cooking utensils. Today they're only used as decoration. Do you have any questions? Pots with two spouts on them, and that, is that uh, an important kind of tool, or is that just for decoration? The ones with the two spouts come from the western tribes. They used it in wedding ceremonies. It is called a wedding vase. Our next stops. Blow guns are made from river cane, which is found along the river banks in this area. They gather the cane stored to dry in the main easy land behind him. Once the cane is dried, it retains your crooked shape and must be straightened. To straighten the cane, they'll hold it over an open fire. While the inner fibers of this cane are warm, they become flexible, allowing them to straighten the cane by bending it over their knees. Once the cane has been straightened, they'll use a metal tool or sharp pointed end to knock out the joints of the cane. By using another metal tool, with a rough attachment at the end, they'll smooth out the inside. Before the introduction of metal, we were using a long wooden shaft with a rough piece of flint attached to the end to knock out the joints of the cane. The dart for the blow gun, the shaft of this dart is made from the yellow locust. The tail is made from the gown of the Scottish thistle. Thistle was gathered and stored to dry and the many is hanging back here. Once the thistle had been dried, they'll take the down out of the pod, place it between their thumb and forefinger, then they roll it onto the shaft by using strength. Blow guns were never used in warfare, only for hunting small game such as rabbits and squirrels. The distance that the blow gun will shoot depends upon the length of the blow gun and the person's lung power. Later on in your tour, you'll see a demonstration of the blow gun.
baskets are made from two different types of materials. This is river cane, this one is white oak. Working with river cane, they gather the cane, split it into several narrow splints. By peeling out the inner fibers of this cane will make it thinner and flexible for them to work with. When working with white oak, they gather white oak saplings, cut them into sections by the grain of the wood in these sections of split it into several narrow splints. By scraping both sides of the splints, they'll make it thinner and flexible for them to work with. Once the splints have been made, they'll dye them by boiling them a different type of roots and barks. Yellow comes from yellow root, orange comes from blood root. The brown comes from walnut bark, and black comes from butternut bark. These are all natural dyes and they do not fade. When weaving their baskets, they use two different types of weaving. This is a single weave. This one is a double weave. To make a single weave basket, they construct the bottom first. Weave up on the sides to a desired height. Finish by putting on the rim. To make a double weave basket, they weave the inside to a desired height, bend back the splints, keep weaving down the outside of this basket. Complete this type on the bottom. Before the introduction of metal, we were making our baskets from hickory bark. Knives that were used to make them were made from flint. Do you have any questions? Arrowheads are made from flint, which is found in parts of Kentucky and Tennessee. At one time, these parts belonged to the Cherokee. To make an arrowhead, they'll start out by using a large piece of flint. Using a large river stone, they'll break off smaller pieces of flint. Then by using smaller river stones, they'll give the arrowheads a general shape. By pressing down with the point of a deer's antler, we'll give the arrowheads a more permanent shape. Cherokees use two different types of arrowheads. This first type is a round-shouldered arrowhead was attached to the shaft by using fibers of the Indian hemp plant. We use this type in hunting. When shot into an animal's body, this type could be removed and reused. This second type of arrowhead is called the high-shouldered arrowhead. Was attached to the shaft by using animal sinew. We use this type in warfare. When shot into a human's body, the sinew would expand on mixing with the blood, causing the arrowhead to be cut out, left in the body, or pushed on through. Shafts of these arrows are made from mountain cane, similar to river cane, but is smaller and grows in higher elevation. The tails of these arrows are made from tail feathers of the wild turkey. You'll now have a demonstration of the blowgun. on the bait, it triggered a log in front to fall, usually breaking the bear's back or pinning down the bear until a hunter came along. Stockade is built around the traps to prevent animals from entering through the back and still on the bait. This trap is usually built larger than the one you see here today. This second kind of trap is a fish trap. This is made from river cane placed in shallow water facing downstream. So once the fish was to swim upstream, they'll be caught inside by the sharp pointed sticks. Sticks was attached together by using buckskin. When buckskin was wet, it became flexible, allowing the sticks to sway in the current, keeping the fish trapped inside. Once the fish was trapped, they then be removed by the lid on the top, only in the times when they were needed. The third kind of trap is the figure four trap or a bird trap. It's 
to use to catch smaller animals, the bait was scattered around on the inside. When the small animal brushed against the long stick in the center, it broke the CG4 causing the trap to fall catching the animal. The animal would then be removed by the lid on the top. Your next stop is over at corn pounding. This was the method we used to pound our corn into meal. We boiled the corn in hickory ashes. The hickory ashes would act as a lie, removing the husk of the corn. Once the husk was removed, we'd wash it, drain it, place it into the water to be pounded as she's doing now. Once it had been pounded, it was placed in a loosely woven basket to be sifted. Smaller grains fell through this basket, which used as cornmeal. Larger grains that stayed on the inside, which used as size family, five to six. This had to be done for every meal. We noticed that we knew as quickly as possible. The wild was all coming in, have not been trimmed, but are not to be fitted together. Playlists between the logs was mixed with animal hair and straw, keeping it closed after it was dry. On the inside of the cabin, Cabin and the cabin above were not the original home of the Cherokee, were copied from the first white settlers. Later on in your tour, you'll see a replica of the original home of the Cherokee. Across the path behind you is a sweat house, every family owned one. During the summer, was used for storage, during the spring and winter, the storm was left. The largest sweat house belonged to a medicine man. He used it for the hospital. Little person was sick and placed on one of the benches. yarn while weaving she does two different types of weaving a single weave which will make a plaid and checkered design with an over and under method the double weave which is similar to the weave that is done on a loom this will make a larger variety of design before this modern material was introduced we were using mulberry root bark and fibers from the indian hemp plant we dyed them with the same colors you saw in the basket section while weaving, she can work from 10 to 200 strands at a time. Once the weave has been completed, these could be worn as belts or sashes or be sewn together to make blankets or shawls. If you notice the cabin above, this is the original home of the Cherokee. This is why the photo found our people living in around the 1540s. <coughs> we constructed this home by placing large poles into the thatch roof was raised high in the center for ventilation. This is there because we built our fires in the center of the room. Our people never lived in teepees or wigwams because we were a farming tribe and not nomadic to have to follow the animal herd for food. We may go and talk Touch it. It's strong. It's still on now. It will be right there. It'll come off. It's recording. Before we had no written language, it was passed down verbally. That's what I said.
Phillips Street to get a log down, we were using the burning method. Square packs of clay on the base of the tree to start the fire. While the clay was damp, we would control the fire, causing the fire to burn down instead of up. Once the tree had fallen, we'd strip off all the bark, pack the clay on the top, setting small fires. Small fires would then have to have died out, they would use the stone axe, chop away all the charcoal. By using the burning method, two could be for six to eight months to complete a canoe. After the introduction of metal, it took three to four weeks. Our original canoes were 30 to 40 feet long, three to four feet wide, holding 10 to 12 men. They'd ride in a kneeling or standing position. To move and balance the canoes, we were using the poling method. This is where we used the long poles that reached the river banks and the river bottoms. Canoes were there, never used in warfare, only for fishing, and transportation weighed from 800 to 900 pounds. Once the canoe was made, it would last in that The mask and dough bows are carved from soft wood such as buckeye or cucumber. Our bows are made from yellow loaf, which is a strong and flexible wood string. It's made from braided fibers of the Indian hemp plant. Before the introduction of metal, this is the type of gardening hoe that we use. The blade is made from a large piece of flint. The handle is a stick of rhododendron. Forks and spoons copied from the first white settlers carved out of hard wood such as wild cherry or black walnut. Rattles were used in our ceremonial dances. First rattle was made from a gourd. Second rattle was white pine. Rattles and mice will be explained to you in one dash by the guide on the square ground. The pipes were carved from pipe stone. This first pipe represents the bird clan. Seven-sided pipe represents the seven clans. The clan system will also be explained to you by the guide in the council house. To drill holes in the pipes, we were using the crossbow drill. This is made from an interchangeable piece of flint. This large wheel would have been a large river stone used for weight. The seashells, smaller ones, were used as decorations. Larger shells were ground down, made into a powder, and used for a paint. Our next stop is up the path to the storage house. The pottery and animal fur. This completes my part of your tour. I hope you've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed being your guide. Your next stop is on the path to the round building, which is on your left. You can go in and have a seat. Thanks for having me here. Every Cherokee village had a council house that was built as close to the center of the village as possible. The door was constructed as a winding corridor so that the inside was never seen from the outside. It's seven-sided and there are seven sections of seats. That's because at one time our people lived under a clan system. We do not know how this originated or why we knew were heads of clans. The names of the clans were bird, deer, wolf, paint, blue, long hair, and wild potato. Members of a clan were considered one fa a large family. They could not marry among themselves. If a man wanted to marry, he would mate from one of the other six clans, and upon doing so, he would leave his clan, join his wife's clan, and any children that they had would inherit their clanship from their mother. <coughs> the white gourd, the white bowl would have been used to approve protection ceremony. Our people believed that drink, drink of spring water from these best vessels. <coughs> The eagle ones you see on top of the poles would have been used in our ceremonial eagle dance, and if you haven't been to the square ground, this will be explained more in depth to you there. The design around the fireplace has no significant meaning. There would have been a fire burning here year-round. There were men assigned to this job whose only duty was to make sure that this fire never 